coming up on In the Life. A look at gay films and their creators, including interviews with producer Christine Vachon and Academy Award winning director John Schlesinger. A tour around the world to honor Pride Without Borders. And the winners of In the Life's short film and video festival. All up next on In the Life, America's information line on gay and lesbian issues and culture. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Lily Achenkloss, Peggy and Richard M. Danziger, the Guild Foundation, James C. Hormel, Michael A. Leppin, Richard Winger, and the In the Life Membership Network. In the Welcome to In the Life. I'm Katherine Linton. In tonight's program, we'll focus on the current explosion of lesbian and gay cinema. We'll show clips from films and videos which are sometimes celebratory, sometimes controversial, but always groundbreaking and almost always difficult to find. So we present these works tonight on television because their relevance and importance merits as wide an audience as possible. At the end of this program, we'll provide a phone number that you can call to find out more information about any of these films. Tonight we'll also show two short films in their entirety, and these are the winners of In the Life's first annual short film and video festival. When I go to mosque, I feel I'm just like everybody else. I go there for a purpose, to pray. In the first part of this episode, we'll look at videos made specifically for educational purposes. The first, by Oscar award-winning filmmaker Deborah Chasnoff, was four years in the making. Indeed, it's a film that no one thought could be made. Entitled It's Elementary, it's about elementary and middle schools across the country that have found success discussing gay issues and homophobia in the classroom. Homosexuality is an essential quality of humanness and that its expression is the right of every human being. The question is, do we really want our youngsters subjected to that. Wouldn't it be better to let them decide that at some point later in life? We want to educate them to it just to make sure that they have a good shot at becoming lesbian or homosexual. I suppose that's the rationale. Well, I think the people who want to stop gay doesn't know what gay is all about and why people are gay. But let this filth come into our classrooms, that's fine. And you wonder what's wrong with America? You wonder what's wrong with America? Who like really cares if you're gay? It's like barely nobody knows in the world. It's like, what's what's the big whoop? Okay, we're gonna do a web today. So I'm gonna put the word gay on the board in the middle, and we're going to make the web coming out in all directions. I think I should add lesbian, too? Okay. I'll put gay or lesbian. What about and? Gay and lesbians. And or? Yeah. All right. There we go. Okay, we ready? Louie. Homophobia? Homophobia. Let's put that over here. All right, well, let's put that kind of on the same side since probably calling names is connected to being scared of somebody because you call somebody names. Discrimination. What do you think the answer to these questions are? Should, should gays be allowed to marry? Should they not? What I want you to do is have a discussion. And of course, when you have a discussion, not everybody agrees. But everybody does listen to one another and uh, try to understand each other's positions. Uh, I don't see why they shouldn't. Yeah, I, know. I don't see why they shouldn't get married. I know I'm being leveraged yeah. together. It's just like any other people. 
they just can't get married like that. I mean, one might have a disease and they won't get married and they won't even know about it. And then maybe the, the other person might catch it and then they won't be able to get married. But a man and a woman could have a disease also like that. I think they're gay, that means one they have the disease. I think gay people should get married. Guys, if they love the one, let them get married. I know. Let's say if Andre is about to get married to Eric. I'm just doing this, but I am the judge and I'm saying, no, you two can't get married. I don't care if you love them. You can't get married. How do you think you guys would feel? Mad? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you think that they can't get married? I don't know. I don't get it. Neither do I. It's like, who cares if we were gay? Do you care? No. So, it's like, duh, you're gay. It's Elementary is part one of a series of four films called Respect for All. These films are designed to combat homophobia and other prejudices in early childhood education. Our next clip, from both my mom's names are Judy, is about kids who feel the effects of negative stereotyping every day. These are the kids of lesbian and gay parents. The film was created to educate grade school teachers about these issues and was produced by the San Francisco-based Lesbian and Gay Parents Association. Both of my mom's names are Judy. Coincidence, I guess. Um, I have an extended family. There are lesbians, gays, straights, and kids in this family, and I like it a lot. It would be easier for me to be open about my lesbian parents, my lesbian moms, if teachers would talk to kids about lesbian and gay parents. And they would tell them that they weren't bad. Or that straight people and lesbian and gay people are equal. And that they shouldn't tease other people who decide to, quote, come out of the closet about their parents. I think part of the reason some of the kids, a couple of the kids felt uncomfortable is because we weren't talking about it till third grade. And I think that kindergarten, first grade isn't too young. They could start um, having people talk about, like kids talk about it to the whole school and tell them that gay and lesbians aren't bad, and that they're no different from any other parents or people. Moving from the classroom to the church, this next clip is from a film that was made in direct response to an anti-gay video and organizing tool called Gay Rights Special Rights. To date, well over 50,000 copies of that right-wing tape have been circulated throughout the country, everywhere from churches to school boards to all 536 members of Congress. The film All God's Children is one response. There is a place, and I have found it. Whether or not Christ spoke to lesbians and gays, he certainly didn't speak negatively. He seemed to speak positively. Whosoever will, let him or her come. I remember when I was growing up in the church, um, a woman of color and gay, I felt like I was the only gay person on the face of the earth at 9, 10, 11 years old. You know, I, I must have been the, I felt I was the only gay person in my church. So I think it's important when Lavender Light goes around the country and sings at different institutions that the gay youth can see, oh, there, there are other people out there that are like me, that, that we are normal, there's nothing wrong with us. If I had known my son would have only lived 33 years, I would have been out there on a soapbox saying, this is my son, he's gay, but he's good. He's kind, he's well-learned. This is my son. 
I would have done that. So what I do now, everywhere I go, I carry papers in my bag. This is my son. He was gay. He died of AIDS at 33. But he was a wonderful young man. And I elaborate on all the wonderful day things that he has done in his life. And everybody says, how can you do that? How can you do that? Because he was mine, and I birthed him, and I brought him in the world, and I loved him unconditionally. There is a bomb in Gilead. As long as we can keep America divided, then we don't have to talk about economic uh, equality. We don't have to talk about human equality. As long as we can say this person's bad and this group is bad and let's keep these groups out, then we don't have to even talk about the kingdom of God. We can always say we got to purify first. And somehow it's amazing who always has the answer what's pure. Dr. Sylvia Rue, co-producer of All God's Children, will be training activists to bring the video into African-American church communities across the nation. Our final educational video, Wide Time Surviving AIDS, is used by HIV and AIDS support groups to challenge the myth that AIDS always leads to immediate disability and death. My name is Raul. I've had full-blown AIDS for six years now and counting. I've been staying quite healthy. My friend Mimi and I decided to investigate how and why some people with AIDS become long-term survivors and beat the odds. We went to Staten Island to meet a woman named Barbara who's been living with full-blown AIDS for more than nine years. The doctor came in on my birthday, no less. He came in to give me my results of my test. He told me to continue drinking and party and have a good time because I'm going to die. I will most likely not see Christmas of 85. I was down to 87 pounds, and I was angry. I threw the water pitcher at the doctor, chased him out of my room, and I badmouthed him and said, your mother's going to die. I am not going to die. I met Bill, six-year AIDS survivor, when we both went to a high school to talk with kids about living with AIDS and was impressed by his commitment to sharing the truth about his life. It's not just a physical disease, it's a spiritual and an emotional disease. So you ha it, it's, it's almost like my alcoholism. As a matter of fact, they mirror each other. So you just can't work on one part and expect to be okay. You have to look at it at its entirety. And when you can do that, I think you'll find that people live a lot longer. One of the big lies concerning AIDS and one of the most dangerous is the notion that AIDS is always fatal. In fact, it has never been always fatal and it's not always fatal now. This is almost like psychological genocide and it causes tremendous problems for people. It might even kill them if they have a belief that they have a, a disease that's incurable and they lose hope and they, why bother doing anything? It could be deadly. I came into this world kicking and screaming. I'm going out the same way. I'm going to kick and scream. I'm going to give it all I have, you know, just to live another day. Once I read this Mexican saying that, that says, um, life may not, only, may, may not always be long, but it can be white. And uh, so I was reading that and I said, well, that's exactly what I'm feeling. You know, maybe my life it may not be as long as some other life, but it can be wide. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to make it as wide as possible. The contributions of gay and lesbian filmmakers does come in many forms. For example, Rick McKay picked up a video camera for the very first time last year while British director John Schlesinger has been working in the industry for over three decades, garnering international recognition for his work. Writer, actor, and film buff Charles Bush explains. Sounds appalling. When the
When Academy Award winning director John Schlesinger passed through New York to talk about his new film Cold Comfort Farm, we jumped at the opportunity to talk to the openly gay director who gave us such films as Sunday Bloody Sunday, Midnight Cowboy, and Marathon Man. Yeah, so many of your films have had, uh, in a very effortless kind of way, had uh, gay characters in supporting roles. I just recently saw Darling again, and, and the ca wonderful character of M Malcolm is just so kind of matter of fact. Yes, who goes off with the way to the same way to yeah. Julie Christie goes off with. Well, well, in well, 1965, that was, was that hard to, to um, pull no, off? No, it wasn't hard to pull off. I mean, uh, um, it was part of the lifestyle of that girl and um, uh, essential really to the film. It wasn't as if it was as shocking as the male kiss in well, yeah. Sunday Bloody Sunday a few years later. Now, how, did, how did you pull that off? Because now today there would have been a whole big uproar still is. The thing about Sunday Bloody Sunday, which shocked United Artists when they first saw it, the fact that Peter Finch was playing a non-stereotypical gay person, a doctor, Jewish, I think that that was their reaction. They were very embarrassed by it because it didn't present someone that was an easy stereotype. And that was what I was after. And we've seen very little of that since. Not a lot. Yeah. Was Peter Finch apprehensive about it? No, neither of them were. It was quite extraordinary. When Peter Finch was asked why he did it, he said, I did it for England. <laughs> but, um, no, they, funnily enough, not. His wife was the one that complained. His wife at festivals and premieres and things of the film would shriek when she saw it very loudly. Oh. So when it came up on the screen, she'd go, ah! And I said, oh, for Christ's sake, shut up. You know, <laughs> you're ruining it for everybody else. Uh, oh, I can't bear to see him do it. I said, well, get used to it. Was there, a, in the late 60s, sort of a climate, though, for just more, for riskier choices to be made? Oh, I think so. There were 10, it was a 10-year period between the 60s and 73, 74, 75, whatever it was, when we hadn't got into the big blockbuster special effects stuff. And, and there was an audience for these films. Um, I never went into Midnight Cowboy thinking it would have the kind of success that it's enjoyed for so many years. Mm -hmm. I just loved the subject, I loved the characters, and I thought it is a fantasy about someone going to New York and imagining one set of circumstances which I could easily put myself into that position. And I thought, right, I, c I think I'm able to do this film. Although there is um, plenty of wit and humor in all of your films, this, is, this film, Cold Comfort Farm, is one of your rare forays into out-and-out -out comedy. Mary said in her last letter that you were still looking for English film stars. Sure am, but I don't want sissies. Sissies give me a pain in the neck. They're starting to give the goddamn American public a pain in the neck, too. I want a man to fetch the women. The characters are very eccentric and somewhat over the top a little bit. They are real people, and I, I wanted to preserve that. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. John Schlesinger told me that day that he hopes his next project will be to direct the screen adaptation of Larry Kramer's play about AIDS, The Normal Heart. That made me think about Hollywood's most recent forays into gay subjects. For instance, when Mike Nichols set out to direct The Birdcage, more than a few people wondered if the straight director would truly capture the essence of the over-the-top gay story. Fairy dust, fairy dust, fairy dust. Well, In the Life has learned that Mike Nichols, in preparing for his challenge, enlisted the help of Rick McKay, whose job it was to travel the world with high eight camera in hand and film the mysterious world of the drag queen. The existence of such footage made us very curious. Rick, how did you become involved in the film of The Birdcage? A friend of mine was working on the film, and he told me that Mike Nichols was looking for someone to go out and shoot footage of drag queens in places that he couldn't get to because of his schedule. And the funny thing was, I didn't know very much about drag queens. I was kind of ashamed of myself as a gay man, not knowing anything about it, but I didn't. Sounds like Mission Impossible. <laughs> it looked like Mission Impossible for a while. I had about 17 days to hit four countries and see about 60 shows.
believe me, your feet hurt after eight hours in high heels. You know, especially since most of us wear at least four inch heels, if not higher. Sylvester Stallone has to pump his iron. I gotta pump my foam rubber. I don't look like this. <laughs> this is just something I'm doing today, going home like this. But I'm a very masculine man. Mike Nichols wrote me a wonderful letter when I was finished, and he went through the list naming his favorite drag queens in each city and David doing Liza and some people. The measure of what Mike Nichols may have learned can be seen on the screen. You are family too. Please sing along. The measure of what Rick has learned can be seen on stage. But my first director was queer. So I'm here. I learned that it was time for me to come out on stage myself. And I learned about truth, honesty, and courage from teachers that turned out to be in feathers and falsies all over the world. In recent years, an explosion of alternative film festivals have hit the movie circuit, cultivating and providing a forum for new gay and lesbian talent. In the spirit of this trend, we at In the Life decided to host our own short film and video festival for a television audience. Here's correspondent Tanya Barfield with the winners and their films. Producer-director Johnny Simon's documentary, Shaving the Castro, explores the way gay and straight cultures come together in an old-time barbershop. Since it opened its doors on Castro Street in 1947, Louis's Barbershop has seen the neighborhood change from a sleepy, blue-collar Irish-Italian community to the world's most famous gay mecca. We asked Johnny what inspired him to make a film about this place and the people who meet there. So I went in and got my hair cut from, from Louis, and uh, I started talking to him, and I, I mean, the shop is beautiful visually. It's all these old 1930s chairs and mirrors and lamps. And so that was really kind of inspired me. But, but mostly it was talking with this guy and realizing that he's been there. He's seen this incredible change in this neighborhood. And he has stories to tell about you know, what it's like. And he's, in a sense, he's a symbol of what, what can happen in terms of gay men and lesbians and straight people all coexisting in, a, in an environment. I love the feeling of the trimmers on your neck. And whenever I got that done when I was a little kid, it used to make me shiver. But it used to make me feel really good just for a moment. And even when I get it done today, it still makes me feel the same way. The shop has been there since 1932. It's uh, one of the oldest establishments in Castro. I started back in 1947, right here in San Francisco. When I first started working on the Castro area, there were a lot of families in the neighborhood. Saturdays, uh, the shop was full with kids. The mother would bring in one or two kids, or sometimes three kids, to get a haircut. And then the neighborhood gradually started changing, and all of a sudden, there were no kids coming in. It was mostly men. And uh, it just went on changing until it became what it is today. Today, it's a gay area. Originally, in the early 70s, no self-respecting homosexual would go to Louis because it wasn't a hair salon. It was sort of a barber shop. But I liked it because there was no fuss, no mess. 
there's the same kind of interaction with people that you used to have a long time ago with like the town barber. You know the people in the community, you see them every day. Blues is almost like the flip side of that traditional male bonding barbershop kind of place. When I was first coming to the Castro at about 18, I remember looking in this barbershop and thinking how cool it would be to work in a barbershop like this. You get like uh, alcoholics who just came in from the, from the bar in the morning to, you know, men in suits who work downtown to like dykes and not lesbians because they want to be called dykes. And then queers and, you know, older gay men and straight men and straight women. Customers that come in, I don't uh, see them with labels. I don't even think of whether they're heterosexual or homosexuals or, or anything else. I just see them as uh, people. I still have a great following of the old timers. And it's nice to see these uh, folks that uh, you've known for many years. They come from all over the city. A lot of my lesbian clients, ever since they were little girls, they always wanted to go with their father and go to the barber shop and get their hair cut, you know, at the barber shop and hang out and be one of the guys almost. And, you know, they never could. And now they can. Having a short haircut and having it trimmed and clipped and precise has for a lot of gay men lots of associations with being a man and being masculine. That's why I think it's very successful in the Castro. It offers a sort of continuity of an experience that most of us have from when we're a kid that we really don't want to give up just because we moved to a gay city. I'm Patrick Swayze, and you're watching In the Life. Still to come on In the Life, a tour around the world as gays and lesbians celebrate Pride Without Borders, and a sneak preview of the eagerly awaited film Stonewall. But first, correspondent Tanya Barfield introduces the winner of In the Life's short film and video festival. The film is called No Regrets, King Tobani's Journey Towards Healing. In No Regrets, co-producers Barbara Anderson and Brad Newcomb profile the life of King Tobani, an openly gay Muslim with AIDS. While Tobani just recently passed away, his unique story remains a testament to his life. Born in Uganda and then moving to Canada, King always kept his sense of humor, compassion, and humanity. In the Life honors both Barbara Anderson and Brad Newcomb with this award. When you hear gay and you hear Muslim, we never put those two together, but there are gays who are born Muslim or raised Muslim. King was willing to share his story. Uh, many Muslims uh, in the Muslim community don't accept homosexuality, and yet King was able to integrate those two and to live in a family that did accept him. Often gays and lesbians who have a strong faith commitment feel that within the gay and lesbian community they're not quite accepted or it's not acceptable to have that faith commitment and that they're not accepted in their own religious traditions as well. So they feel somewhat outside of both communities and there's a real struggle there for them. When you hear a uh, gay Muslim with AIDS, uh, you think of someone very different. All kinds of stereotypes come to mind. And what I would hope for anyone who sees this video is that you begin thinking you're going to see someone very different and you end up seeing someone very much like yourself or myself. Everybody looks at me and say, you look great, you know, like, but they don't know how I feel inside me. It's a different thing, how you look and what you feel is two different things. When I go to mosque, I feel I'm just like everybody else. I go there for a purpose, to pray. I was born as a Ismaili Muslim. 
I had a great childhood. My parents uh, were merchants, uh, quite well off, and as children, we were brought up in a very nice environment. Uganda was considered one of the diamonds of Africa till everything changed in uh, 1970 with takeover of Uganda by Idi Amin and we had to immigrate to Canada. And we moved to Montreal and it was a complete cultural shock. I was very confused at that point because uh, after moving from Africa and uh, things you sort of notice about your puberty, uh, the phases that you go through, uh, feelings and all that. You make choices and you decide not to mess up other people's lives and those are the choices I made and I also to live as a, openly as a gay Ismaili Muslim. Age of 17 I moved to Red Deer, Alberta. The white people were not educated about different nationalities who came into Canada. So um, they were quite racist about it. So we, I, I, remember, I recall a time where we had a cross burning in our front yard in Red Deer. There weren't many gay people, or there were, if there were gay people, they existed, but they didn't express themselves openly. There were a lot of married gay people, I would say, in Red Deer from all religious denominations, but they never sort of came out of the closet. So my, I, myself and a couple of people started a gay group called GARD, G-A-R-D. And we were so, we didn't have much of a self-esteem then. So we used to call ourselves Gun Association of Red Deer. And we used to get together in a school. It was a nice small circle of people. Then we started a group called LARD, <laughs> for Lesbian Association of Red Deer. <laughs> so it was quite fun. I moved to Australia to, it was a time for me to move from Red Deer and discover myself and my, basically my sexuality and the fact that I'd met somebody who I was very fond of in Australia. I got infected by HIV virus in Indonesia. I got quite ill and I came, I went to some of the best doctors in Sydney who couldn't diagnose what was wrong with me because I had so many other complications involved. And I came to, to Vancouver to seek advice to a doctor here. I don't feel that I got punished by God. I think it was my wake-up call, basically. It made me aware of a lot of things that were I was going through in my life. A couple of years ago on a television show where uh, I was introduced as a person with uh, PWA or persons with AIDS. The response from the public to my family was like, I should uh, be ashamed of my sexuality. I should be condemned or burned from all different races. Uh, some of them are psychotic, rather, rather not liberal-minded Muslims, or I call them psychotics, uh, Muslims. And uh, I got a lot of calls, threatening calls as well. But as my mother said to them, you know, get a life, you know, um, rather than wasting time, why don't you educate yourselves? 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Three months ago, I was stuck in the bed and I couldn't sleep at night. I still have a problem sleeping, so I'm, um, I have to take morphine every three hours for pain to all sorts of sleeping pills and things like that just to for discomfort. I was so angry in the sense of I thought I'd resolved everything. I'm not an angry person, but it was just the disappointment of not being able to be in control of myself that I tore, I've been writing for four years, a book called The Body in Exile. I was so angry that I tore the whole book page by page. We'll start with Namaste. We'll Since I got ill three months ago, I've been having support from a lot of people. And one of the treatments I've been having is called Reiki. It's a sort of a spiritual healing treatment. And it's really helped me control my pain and uh, discomfort that I have. I lie down on my back and she does her Zen or Tibetan saying, and then she starts with the healing process. And normally by the time she continues, I'm really relaxed. And it's brought out issues in me that I had blocked over the years, which I thought I'd resolved in my life. So King, breathe in as deeply as you can. 
My nurses, they do therapeutic touch. It's uh, not many nurses in the Western civilization know about therapeutic touch, but it's a healing process that they do on you without touching you. They have the power in the hand. And uh, then I have another person, my physiotherapist who comes and does acupressure, which is a similar thing to acupuncture, but it's done with a special gun, um, which just stimulates your nerves and all that. So all those have really helped me get better, I feel. When I'm feeling good, I go out and reach out and help people as much as I can. I started uh, with persons with AIDS Society, the hairdressing thing, and now they have the hairdressing services provided. Well, just because life is short and doesn't as many have to settle for a lousy haircut. <laughs> No, he still could look good dying. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. when you're looking good, you're feeling good, right? Yeah. Then I got involved with uh, uh, Loving Spoonful, which used to be formerly a Vancouver Meal Society that provides meals for people with AIDS at home. Then Friends for Life, a centre that started two years ago for anybody with terminal illnesses of any kind, from MS to HIV to cancer to whatever. It's an emotional and physical support so centre. Uh, we have all sorts of support groups here. I meet a lot of gay Muslim boys, or um, I discuss the situation with them, and I try and make them honest, trying to be, say, you know, talk to your family about it. Because just don't think about yourself, just think about what they will feel if something is, you know, when they find out later in their life. Or you get married because you think you're expected to get married and messing up other people's lives. Vancouver is a city where there's a lot of gays move here from mid-Canada to down east or whatever to live an openly gay lifestyle. And they think they're living an openly gay lifestyle and they're really not. Because we haven't educated them about their self-esteem, they don't have the nerves to go and discuss their sexuality or the disease with the family. And they only think about themselves, they don't think about their family. So sometimes I suggest to a lot of people that I've helped and counseled that they should reverse the pattern and become their parents and see what a parents would feel like. When I got sick was basically the beginning of living for me. I'm not ashamed of uh, what I have. I wouldn't reverse my status for the world. Um, I would reverse the pain sometimes. That's the only thing that scares me is the pain and not being able to do things that I was able to do before. But otherwise, I have no regrets whatsoever. Films like No Regrets bring to light what it means to live as a gay or lesbian person in another culture and country. Over the years, In the Life has brought you many stories from around the world. Now we'd like to revisit some of the past season's best in recognition of this year's international gay pride theme, Pride Without Borders, a theme that reminds us of the realities gays and lesbians face worldwide. Growing up in Ireland was very difficult because there were absolutely no role models. In Russia, it's widely spread opinion that gay people are mentally ill. In some other countries, there is not a crime to be a homosexual, but they've just been exterminated as it happened in Colombia. In 1995, correspondent Miguel Arenas went with a group of Americans to Havana, Cuba, on a cultural exchange with the gay and lesbian community there. This September, that American group, now called Queers for Cuba, hopes to bring some of the people they met there to the United States. Together, they'll create the Rainbow Revolution Tour, Lesbian and Gay Cubans Tell It Like It Is. I think that in the 70s, there were other more important things to think about. It was the beginning of a revolution, and everything was focused on that. 
y todo estaba en función de eso. Ahora hay una cosa bastante novedosa. Now there is something quite novel. We are trying to forge ahead with a kind of gay and lesbian alliance here in Cuba. Una especie de alianza gay y lesbiana aquí en Cuba. Tener un espacio. We want a space, a space where we can meet, talk, analyze our issues, and even get to know people. It's not to tolerate us or accept us, but to respect us as we respect them. It's to win that space that we are not begging for, but that we deserve. We have a right to, because we are born here, we are from here, so we deserve a space. homosexuality in Havana in the latter part of the 20th century, in a special period, on an island divided, blockaded, and I don't mind saying so. And then you realize, with this enormous amount of weight on top of the weight of being homosexual, it still continues to be a burden, an onerous burden, and I don't know when it will end. All of the pressures that we have, economic pressures, we lack so much, materially, spiritually, intellectually. So on top of this, if I'm going to make myself crazy, I don't think I would make it. It seems that even though there are all these difficulties, if I can grow and be who I am, value myself as a woman, as a black person, as a lesbian, as whatever, then I think that to a great extent it will help me to overcome all the limitations that we face. Valuing oneself as a lesbian and a woman while facing intense social and economic oppression was a resounding theme at last September's Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, China. Correspondent Jocelyn Taylor was there, covering the meetings that barely made the international news. kilometers outside of Beijing, here in Wairo, the NGO, or Non-Governmental Organization Conference, is the heart and soul of this international event. Women have gathered from grassroots organizations all over the world to caucus on women's issues. And the existence of the lesbian tent ensured high visibility and some shelter from the constant rain. One of the most common accusations of, about lesbian rights and lesbian issues is that it's not a concern of people from Asia, from Africa, or from Latin America. It's, it's something that the Australians, the North Americans, and the Europeans like very much because they're rich. But seeing the diversity of the people uh, attending the, the workshops, coming together at the lesbian tent every day, it's very encouraging. I was really curious, you know, about this lesbianism. In India, we don't, we have, have uh, I mean, we don't know. We don't know much about lesbianism. Here I learned, I learned that it's something natural, no? Lesbianism is some, it's a natural, it's a way of life and something natural uh, with some people. There's nothing that's guaranteed here for the people who live here, and certainly not for the lesbians who live in China. Um, when I was here in 1972, the Cultural Revolution was still in effect. Chairman Mao was still alive. Anybody who deviated in any way from the going political line was in danger of, of being killed. Today, there's actually Chinese lesbians who come forward who have to be secret in their day-to-day -day life here in China, but they'll come to a conference like this and reveal themselves to be lesbians. Beijing, if nothing else, will have ensured that lesbian networking and, and lesbian strength has, is a reality all over the world.
The fact that lesbians from around the world met and mobilized in Beijing, China, serves as an amazing testament to this year's gay pride theme, Pride Without Borders. But even as we recognize these milestones, we're reminded of how far there is to go in a segment that In the Life aired recently. Ciprian Cucu and Marian Matashku were a young Romanian couple who were arrested and incarcerated in a Romanian prison for being homosexual. After many abusive months in the prison, and after the story was printed in the local paper announcing their homosexuality, they were freed through the efforts of Amnesty and the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. But their incredible hardship didn't end there. After my release, I was expelled from the last year of high school under the pretext that I had missed too many days of school. In fact, teachers declared my homosexuality a danger to the other students. Marianne tried to find a job, but no business would hire him. When he finally found employment, he had to give it up because of harassment from his colleagues who knew about his case. We tried to continue our relationship, but it eventually ended because of the pressure we encountered from people who knew our story. In May of this year, Marianne committed suicide. <laughs> He killed himself because he could not bear the pressure of isolation and fear. I had lived with the hope that one day we would stand together again. I loved him tremendously and could not believe I had lost him, but destiny took away this ultimate hope. If there was any hope to be found at the end of that story, it's this. In May of this year, Ciprian was granted asylum here in the United States. Now, while strides are being made in asylum appeals and other legislative areas, it's still hard for most people to imagine a society in which gays and lesbians are truly respected. Surprisingly, though, such a society did exist right here in the United States before the arrival of Christopher Columbus. Join us now in the last leg of our journey for a look into the hearts and minds of two-spirit people. Follow your heart's desire, light up the sky on fire. The Lakota holy man, Lamebeer, Tachta, Tachta Ushde, mentioned that the Creator never made anyone different without giving them something extra special. And we have those very, very special things that we offer to everyone around us. I think the European invasion, the missionaries that came and, and said this is perverted, uh, changed the thought patterns of a lot of our, our elders and, and the people that are now existing, I think, have adopted, you know, the idea that being gay or lesbian is, is bad. The Apaches have a word called heokia, which is the same, it's the tradition of being uh, a two-spirited person. Then my mom's language in Sahaptan, the word is wakha. My mom told me about three years ago what the term in our northern Paiute uh, language uh, was to describe the, the, the two-spirited person, and the word is tibets. In the Great Basin tribes, they call it the basket and the bow ritual or ceremony where a young man at the age of puberty was given that choice, like women, was given a choice between the basket and the bow. They went for the bow and meant that that person throughout that person's life will carry on as, quote, as a man. Uh, and that the basket, if a man, little boy picked up the basket, he was to carry on the role as, as the two-gendered person, the two-spirited person. It's gender roles, it's not sexual roles. You see what I mean? It has about little to do with biology. It has a great deal to do with how you function in the community. From my understanding, before the European um, invasion among our people, gay and lesbian people were reverent and honored in the tribe. 
and oftentimes had special healing powers and special healing gifts. Gay men or women would be called upon to raise orphans from within the tribe because um, they, haven't, they were seen to have a lot to offer and since they didn't have children of their own, they were called upon to, to play a really critical role in terms of raising some of the children of the tribe. I knew at a very early age I was different, um, but when I came out here to California in 74, 75, when I got a chance and an opportunity to meet other lesbian, gay, Indian people, and when we sat down to talk and to share our history as tribal people, uh, that issue always came up. Hey, there is that role, traditional role that we played. Let's bring that role alive and let's make it happen. And I think that was the whole meaning, the whole purpose, um, more so than a social and social and political reasons that we formed Gay American Indians is because of that, that whole issue on history. all over the world and throughout history have had gays and lesbians as part of their culture. The international gay rights political movement, though, started less than 30 years ago, sparked by the 1969 Stonewall Riots here in New York City's Greenwich Village. Now, as crucial as those three days in June were, however, telling the real story behind the events becomes increasingly difficult because everyone's version and memory is slightly different. That was the challenge faced by director Nigel Finch and producer Christine Vachon when they made the film Stonewall, a fictionalized account of the characters and events leading up to the riots 27 years ago. So which are you, he or she? Well, you know it ain't hip to call it DQ interested in doing a film about Stonewall for a lot of reasons. Uh, I mean, one was purely, um, you know, for the fun of it, like for, to recreate the period, to, um, you know, to, to recreate that kind of, you know, historical incident. There was, it was a big challenge. story of my damn life. Basically, it's, it's um, the events leading up to the Stonewall riots told through two different love stories. And one of the love stories is with my character and with a Midwesterner who comes in from out of town. But well, you ain't never been in love like this before, baby. He's absolutely in love with La Miranda. I don't do love. She's a, a young Puerto Rican drag queen who's, um, who frequents the Stonewall. She's been hustling on the streets since she was 11, but I played it with a big heart. First and foremost, Nigel wanted to make, you know, a, a romantic story, and he really, one thing that was really, really important was to show the drag queens as, as sexual beings, which I, I think hasn't, certainly hasn't been done before in mainstream Hollywood films. Kissy, kissy. <laughs> When we were shooting the film, Nigel was very public about being HIV positive. Technically, the film was not finished before Nigel died, but we pretty much put the finishing touches on it after his death. And I was trying to finish it very much in the spirit that he would have wanted. And cut! There had been race riots, there had been anti-war riots, and now it was time for the gay riot. I realized once we even just started to sort of like you know, prick the surface of the event, people's emotions ran so high and it was so, everyone had such a strong sense of ownership over what happened and who was there and what they had to do with it. Bust that one for looking at me funny. <laughs> what the hell? Bust the selection. It was like nobody could agree on anything. It happened on one night, it happened over three nights. It lasted an hour, it lasted three hours, it lasted ten minutes. Don't push me, Mary, I am not in the mood. There was no real sense anywhere that you were hear hearing what the truth was, so it made us really question, 
you know, it made us question the whole idea of truth as connected to this event, which was fascinating. Miranda girl, why do you always put yourself through this? It's for the sheer, irresistible, goddamn glamour of it all. To them, the greatest political statement you can make is to be fabulous. Me, I'm living in the other state between maleness and femaleness. Which is? Fabulousness. The heels were extremely uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was adventurous. I think there's a queen in all of us. <laughs> hey, bros. Bros and sisters with soul. I'm ready for action. Where do I sign? In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Lily Achenklaas, Peggy and Richard M. Danziger, the Guild Foundation, James C. Hormel, Michael A. Leppin, Richard Winger, and the In the Life Membership Network.